Okay, everybody. Hopefully, I'm on air now. We'll find out in just a couple of minutes. If we've never been introduced before, my name is David Guzik. I'm so pleased that you could join me for what is, for me, a Thursday afternoon. I don't know what time or what place it is for you, but uh, I'm here on the West Coast of the United States and uh, here to do a weekly question and answer time. If we've never met before, uh, I am a pastor, a preacher, a Bible teacher, and some people know me from an online Bible commentary that I have that uh, some people find helpful. What I like to do is come together with you, our live YouTube audience, once a week, whenever I'm possible, whenever it's possible for me to do it, and I answer your questions. We start out with a lead question that I'm going to get to in just a moment. And then after the lead question, we'll take questions that come in on the live chat. We don't get to all the questions that come in on the live chat, but we do appreciate whatever we can get to. And we're very pleased that you could join us today. I want to give a special greeting to our TWR360 audience. That's the online presence of Trans World Radio. And I do want to say to the TWR360 folks and anybody else, I, I doubt it would be just If there's any TWR360 staff or on the team there, uh, I'm going to be at, I and our producer are going to be at the uh, NRB, National Religious Broadcasters Convention, uh, coming up this next week in Nashville. And I will uh, make it a point to stop by the NRB, uh, N, uh, NRB, to stop by the TR, TWR, Trans World Radio booth, and uh, hope to have a, a greet with the TWR360 folks. So welcome to our TWR360 audience. All right, let's get on to our uh, lead question today. Uh, lead question comes from Magda, and she sends this question. It's actually a question that comes up from time to time. And so we've dealt with this before, but I'm pleased to deal with it again. Uh, Magda has this question. Uh, I have a question for you. Many years ago, our pastor at that time gave his opinion on the question of being cremated. Uh, hold on here. Let me just get this. Okay, he gave his opinion on the question of being cremated. He explained that in the days of Jesus on earth, the people that were criminals were thrown in the fire to be burnt outside the city. So there's a bad connection to being burnt. Also, most people were buried. He said that to be laid in the earth is like burying a seed that comes to life when Jesus comes to fetch us. I am a widow for just over a year now, and my husband requested to be cremated presumably because it was the cheapest option. I would love to know your opinion about this. All right, well, Magda, thank you for your question. And I'm happy to deal with that question that, again, it comes up from time to time. People want to know, is cremation permissible for the believer? Does the Bible have to say anything about cremation? Let me just begin with saying the Bible really doesn't have anything specific to say about our modern practice of cremation. Now, it's true that the ancient Hebrews, uh, the Jewish people in the Old Testament times, and in New Testament times for that matter, would have been horrified at cremation, given their thinking of how a dead body should be cared for. It's a very interesting cultural concept that we see reflected in the Bible. It's not commanded in the Bible, but it's reflected in the Bible, that great care and honor should be given to a person's corpse, and probably the greatest horror that could befall a person, or one of the greatest horrors, let's just say that, is to have their dead body, their corpse, desecrated or, or treated shamefully. When you see that idea presented in the Old Testament, it treats it with horror. So by tradition, the ancient Hebrews were not in favor of cremation. And it's also true that some early Christians in the first few centuries of Christianity and then beyond thought that cremation was either an imitation of pagan Roman customs or secondly, a denial or a disrespect of the biblical principle of resurrection. Matter of fact, you, you may have heard me quote from my commentary from time to time, a uh, Puritan named John Trapp. He wrote in the 17th century, I think, I think in the 1600s, John Trapp is an example of a man who said that believers should not be cremated. 
And again, I want to make it clear, I don't share John Trapp's opinion here, but I just kind of want you to get an idea of how people would think and state this sometimes. John Trapp said this, the bodies of the saints being temples of the Holy Ghost should with reverence be commended and committed unto Christian sepulcher in hope of res the resurrection. You see, his idea was that um, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and so you're sort of uh, disgracing the temple of the Holy Spirit if, um, if you practice the practice of cremation. Now, Magda, I like what you said in your question about your pastor giving his opinion. That's how you phrased your question. My pastor's opinion is, and I like how you phrased that, because that's what it is. We need to be careful about knowing what the Bible says and knowing what it does not say. And we should also be very careful about those people who elevate the traditions of men to the same level as the commandments of God, or they use, um, let me rephrase that, or they make God's commandments of no effect because of their traditions. Now, it, it is absolutely true that the Bible says that God will resurrect these bodies, these bodies that we currently have, that are currently part of our very being. God will resurrect these bodies. Uh, let me just read to you a few passages. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases and to each seed its own body. Now, in her question, Magda kind of related the idea that her pastor talked about uh, a body being buried like a seed being planted. And that imagery is there in the scriptures. Well, without any specific command on how to treat a dead body, it's just using that analogy. Then in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting at verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Friends, I, I understand the idea and if somebody's conscience so moves them to have a great respect for their own dead body to plan that way, hey, when I die, I want my dead body to be treated in such a way. If that's somebody, then wonderful. But I'm here to tell you, no matter what, the body is sown in corruption. No matter what, the body is sown in dishonor. No matter what, the body is sown in weakness. But here's the, the, the great news here, uh, as Paul puts it here, starting at verse 51 of 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and the mortal must put on immortality. Listen, the body of a believer is sown in corruption, in weakness, no matter what. Now, it is absolutely true that God has a plan and a purpose for these bodies. Friends, the Bible makes it very clear that our salvation is total, soul, spirit, body. It's not like the only thing that God cares about you and your soul or your spirit. God has an eternal plan for your body as well. And in some way, our resurrection body will come from these bodies that exist right now. Yet, the bodies of believers are destroyed all the time. There are believers whose body is destroyed by violent destruction. There are other believers, this is much more common, whose bodies are destroyed through decay over time. No matter what, this corruptible body that gets sown in the ground is going to turn to ashes, is going to turn to dust. Look, I think it's well said 
that cremation does to the body in 30 minutes, what 30 years in the ground does. You say, well, I don't want to be left behind only ashes from cremation. Friends, you're going to end up that way no matter what. So again, I'm not saying to anybody that you should be cremated. That's an individual decision. I'm just saying that there's no biblical command against cremation. It's really up to the individual conscience of each believer. You have to say, I kind of like it how the Anglican Book of Common Prayer puts it. And whenever I do a memorial or a funeral, I like to read this passage because I think it puts it very powerfully. Again, from the Book of Common Prayer from the Anglican Church, uh, the Church of England, it says this. In sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God, our brother or sister, of course, and we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The Lord bless him and keep him. The Lord make his face to shine upon him and be gracious to us. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon him and give him peace. Amen. You know, that, that's just beautiful phrasing. We commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Friends, we're all going to turn to dust anyway. And in some way, God will take the molecules of our body and reassemble them into a glorious resurrection body. And here's the good news. God does not need a well-preserved corpse to do this. Now, since there's no specific biblical command against cremation, I think Christians are absolutely free to choose it if it does not violate their conscience. Now, it's true that tradition, both uh, Christian traditions and Jewish traditions, speak against the practice of creation. And I'm not saying that those uh, traditions mean nothing, but they are not of what I would call ultimate concern. Of ultimate concern is what the Bible itself says. So, we have freedom in Jesus Christ about this. If somebody thinks it's better stewardship, a better practice to uh, go through cremation, that's between them and the Lord. It is not a denial of the resurrection. We are all sown in corruption and weakness. It's not like the cremated body is any more corrupt or weak than the body that's laid whole in the ground. Okay, well, Magda, I hope that's helpful for you. Thank you so much for asking your question. Again, I know that this is a question that people have from time to time, so I'm happy to deal with it. All right, our first question from the live chat today comes from a witness for Jesus who asks this. Hi, David. Does the Bible teach separation from other believers if they endorse or fellowship with false teachers? Okay, a a witness for Jesus, um, to me, this is all relevant to the details of what you're talking about. There are Christian brothers who teach things that I think are wrong. I, I mean, if you're really pressing for it, I'd say it's false. Um, I believe that God still appoints and grants the gifts of the Spirit, including the more apparently miraculous gifts of the Spirit. You could say there's something miraculous about every gift of the Spirit. I get that. But let's talk about the apparently miraculous gifts. I think God continues to grant that today. And... I believe that those who teach otherwise, who are often called cessationists, I think they're wrong. Matter of fact, we just finished a 10-part series where I did 10 fairly brief videos on 10 reasons that I, why I think cessationism is wrong. And you're, you're welcome to look at those on our YouTube channel. But, but here's just kind of the point, is that I believe that those who teach otherwise, who teach what is often called cessationism, I think they're wrong but I would not call them false teachers that people should separate from. Just be aware of what they teach. And if you agree with it or disagree with it according to your understanding of Scripture, fine. 
Now, now there's other people who teach things that I think are dangerous. There are people who teach that there is no substitutionary aspect to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That they're against what's sometimes called um, substitutional, uh, substitutionary uh, penal atonement, that kind of uh, penal substitutionary atonement, that, that whole conception that Jesus died and an important aspect, not the totality, but an aspect of what Jesus did on the cross was die uh, standing in the place of guilty sinners and receiving the wrath and the judgment that they deserved. Th- there are Christians that deny that. Now, that is, I think, a wrong teaching. I'd call it a false teaching to deny that there's any substitutionary um, punishment aspect to the atoning work of Jesus Christ. And, and I think that teachers like that should be avoided. So the Bible does say, mark and avoid those people who are divisive and those people who teach contrary to the truth. But we do have to have at least some measure of wisdom and priority in this to where we're not dividing from every single brother or sinner that we might ha- sister that we might have uh, the uh, a a relatively small difference with. Man, if that's the case, then there's no unity in the body of Christ. There really needs to be an ordering of a priority in the Christian mind and to be able to say, look, these are areas of doctrine that we can disagree about and we can have disagreement and I recognize it in you and you recognize it in me, yet we recognize that we're brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And here are some other doctrines that um, are so important and so central and air on them is so dangerous that there should have to be a separation uh, on that basis. So, yes, I, I, I would phrase it that way. It, it all depends in the details of what is meant in your question there, a witness for Jesus, about um, false teachers. So I, I hope that explains it. Th- there's error on either side. There's error on being too accommodating. There's error in being too strict. And we're not looking for like some golden middle where we're always in the middle of the two sides. We're just looking to follow what's biblical in this. And what's biblical isn't always in the middle. (laughs) It could be more to one side or the other. So we're not just trying to make a middle. We're we're trying to find what's biblical. All right. Cade asks this question. How does the Holy Spirit guide a Christian and how do we seek out his guidance on what or where God is calling us to? Love the lead question and your ministry. Well, thank you for that, Cade. Cade, you're asking a question that's actually a little bit difficult to answer, but I think it's a great question. How does the Holy Spirit guide a Christian? Well, let me say, first and foremost, I would say that a Holy, the Holy Spirit guides a Christian through the Word of God. Now, again, I, 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 I wouldn't... I would understand, Kate, if you rolled your eyes just a little bit when I said that. Okay, yeah, we're supposed to read our Bibles, great. But really, that's foundational. This is the clear and incontrovertible way that God has communicated to mankind. Has God communicated in creation? Yes, he has. Has God crea- uh, communicated to, to mankind in conscience? Yes, he has. But there, there's there's that matches nothing to the clarity and the helpfulness and the comprehensiveness with which God has communicated to humanity in and through his word. So, um, if you want to be guided by the Holy Spirit, the first thing is to really put yourself in the word of God. And I'm not necessarily saying that you're going to find a, a, a chapter and verse in the Bible that answers your specific question. But it'll help you to abide in Jesus Christ It'll help you to live in a way that honors him and listens to him. Okay, now beyond the obvious emphasis of being in God's word, I'm a big believer in the way that God guides the believer in a naturally supernatural way. That he simply guides our steps. In other words, um, if I'm trying to pick 
uh, which college I should go to, which university. I, I, I don't have to wait for God to put it in flaming uh, letters in the sky. I don't have to wait for God to uh, speak an audible voice, which I think would be extremely rare for God to, to communicate to somebody in an audible voice. I, I'd be a little bit suspicious of that. I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'd be suspicious of it. Um, instead of looking for those things, live your life in fellowship and in general obedience to God. I, I say the word general because nobody can live a life of perfect obedience to God. But live your life in general obedience to God and fellowship with God and, and really follow sanctified common sense. And there are ways that the Holy Spirit communicates to us, communicates through an impression in our mind, uh, communicates through something else that somebody might say, and the Holy Spirit, so to speak, quickens it, makes it alive to us. But what I'm saying is that we will be open to and be able to discern such communication from the Holy Spirit as we're walking in the Spirit and as we're anchored in the Word. But I don't have any problem with somebody coming up to a big life decision to just saying, listen, uh, walk in the Lord, uh, keep your life right with Him as much as you're able to, and then just simply make decisions using sanctified common sense. Weigh out pluses and minuses and ask God to guide you along the way. So, Cade, okay, there's no one answer to that, but I hope I've given you a general uh, way that we can sort of seek out the guidance of where God is calling us. And then I'll give you one more principle over this, Cade. I think where we are in a station of life matters a lot. And, and look, Maybe I'm unwise for doing this. Maybe I'm making an excuse for myself already, but I'll, I'll just say it. If, um, if a single guy comes to me and says, hey, I think the Lord might want me to move to such and such country and do this and do that. I, I might say, well, have you prayed about it? What do you think about it? You think you could do it yet? Yeah, go for it. Now, if somebody who is married and has three or four kids comes to me and says, hey, I think God might be... Uh, leading us to move and do this, what do you think? I might say, brother, take care, make sure, let's seek the Lord. I really believe that where more people will be impacted by a decision, then it's okay for us to look for more guidance, more confirmation from the Lord on that. And that's been true in some of the big decisions I've made in my life. So, Kate, I hope that is helpful for you. God bless you. Next question comes from Isa, who asks, how can I, or can I, be restored to a close and strong relationship with God after a lot of discouragement leading to stumbling? I prayed and desire restoration, but I'm scared, fallen away. Is there hope? Isa. Jesus said that whoever comes to him, he will in no way cast out. Isa, just from the way that you describe your brief question, it makes me um, believe that you are the target of a lot of uh, condemnation from the evil one. And friends, I, I don't really understand exactly how uh, Satan and his agents, I, I'm thinking of demonic spirits that are in league with Satan. I, I I don't know exactly how they have the ability, how they have the wherewithal to communicate to us or to suggest thoughts to us or to tempt us, but they can have a way of making us feel so, so discouraged. Discouragement is a very powerful spiritual tool that Satan uses like an expert. And so um, you need to understand that there can be a very real and very demonic source to discouragement. And you need to cling close to God and his word. You need to just be able to settle down in the, in the, in the uh, sense of the Lord and to be able to simply say, um, I am weak, but God's promise is strong. God's love is strong. God's faithfulness is strong. And Isa, I would just say, let the faithfulness 
let the goodness of God carry you in this difficult time. It's okay for you to feel weak. He is strong. So be assured and restful in that, Isa. Thank you, and God bless you. Uh, David, uh, Gregory Vaught says this, uh, Did John the Baptist, as a Levite, symbolically bring the Levitical priesthood to a close? Uh, David, that's a very interesting question, something I haven't really thought of before. And it's true what you say, uh, though Jesus and John the Baptist were cousins, John the Baptist, his parents were of the tribe of Levi, uh, the priesthood, actually, of the family of Aaron. And so your question is, did John the Baptist symbolically bring the Levitical priesthood to a close? Um, okay, David, I'll give just the answer off the top of my head. You're asking, so I'm going to answer. My answer would be no. No, and I'll tell you why I would say no. I say no because Hebrews makes it really clear that it was the work of Jesus as our high priest that brings the work of the priesthood to close. That is the fulfillment of the priesthood. It's found in Jesus Christ. But David, I have to tell you something, something that I've been thinking a lot about lately is even though obviously, clearly, importantly, the New Testament tells us that Jesus Christ is the culmination, is the fulfillment of the Old Testament priesthood, and there needs to be no more animal sacrifices for sin. They avail nothing. At the same time, the New Testament church was more open to temple ritual and ceremony than we might expect. And just for a quick reference on that, uh, Peter and John, even after the resurrection of Jesus, even after the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, they're still going up to the temple to pray. On at least two occasions, the Apostle Paul participated in temple rituals, not for the atonement of sin, but to demonstrate devotion and sacrifice and, and set-apartness unto God. So, yes, the priesthood is fulfilled and superseded by Jesus Christ, absolutely, but yet, to me, I'm fascinated by this, and I'm, I'm still trying to work some of this out. I'm just relating the facts. The book of Acts tells us that there was participation by the apostles, not just everyday Christians, there were some everyday Christians involved in this too, but apostles like Peter, John, Paul, the big three, if you will, they participated in temple rituals and ceremonies, even as believers. I find that fascinating. So David, no, I, I'm going to just kind of appreciate your question. It's something I never thought of before. You're kind of stretching my mind a little bit, but my immediate reaction is no. The Old Testament priesthood is not fulfilled with John the Baptist, but with Jesus, the high priest, according to the Order of Melchizedek. Great. Thank you for that question. Next question comes from Laura, who asks, Does rebuking and rejecting the evil as many times as you need to by speaking out loud really work? I was told to do that, but I have my doubts. Okay, Laura, I... I can't give a simple answer to that question because it's a little more complicated than that. Um, I, I assume that what you're speaking of is kind of the idea of um, vocally saying, I rebuke you, Satan. I rebuke your strategies. I rebuke your lies. Um, I, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, Satan. And saying that over and over again. Now, your, your question is, does it really work? Well, number one, yes, if it is done in faith. There are people who do this, but not in faith. They do it in the power of superstition. They do it in the power of, uh, you know, just dreams of, of what they have in their head about uh, this is how things should be. 
uh, just they fancy themselves to be uh, have power in and of themselves, not power in Jesus Christ, but power in and of themselves to boss around the demonic realm. Friends, any authority that the believer has is strictly delegated authority. It's not inherent to the believer, but it's delegated to the believer in Jesus Christ. So we don't rebuke or stand against Satan in our own strength, but only in the strength of Jesus. If those words, if those practices become mere empty rituals, then they really don't have any power. But if they are expressions of genuine faith in Jesus Christ, in genuine resisting of the devil, then I think they can have great effect. Remember what the scriptures say in the letter of James. Submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And if vocally saying such things is an active, true way that somebody practices resistance against demonic powers and spirits, then there's spiritual power in that. But again, not just as mere rituals or magic potions or incantations. God, and I would even say that Satan and his allies in the spiritual realm, not only hear the words spoken, which are important, but they also see the heart behind the words. So that, that's the best way I would explain that to you, Laura. I, I do think that there is a fair amount of superstitious spiritual warfare where people think that the key to spiritual warfare is almost, <clears throat> it would have an analogy in, you know, the world to just like casting spells or doing things like that. And, and we must avoid that kind of thinking. All right, before I get to the next question, let me pause just for a moment and let you know that next week I will not be uh, here at the helm for our weekly Q&A, but I'll have a, a stand-in uh, on our Enduring Word team. We've recently brought on this year my very good longtime friend, Pastor Lance Ralston from Calvary Chapel of Oxnard. Uh, Lance is a dear friend and a trusted associate in the work here of Enduring Word. I'm going to be on an airplane flying back from uh, the National Religious Broadcasters Convention in Nashville, and uh, so I will be unable to carry out our Q&A. But Lance will be here, and I really ask you, tune in and ask Lance your very toughest questions. Just go ahead and do it. Give him your tough ones. Give him the questions that you don't want to ask me because they're too tough. Lance will be able to answer them brilliantly. And may I add, Lance on our Enduring Word channel, YouTube channel, uh, has begun and is three, four, five weeks into an amazing series on church history. I strongly recommend that you check it out. Again, it's on our Enduring Word channel. Just look for the, uh, I think it's released perhaps on Friday, the Friday video that comes out from uh, Pastor Lance Ralston having to do with church history. Really great work. Okay, next question comes from Casey, who asks, Pastor, would you take some time to speak on the He Gets Us campaign? Christian marketing campaign that was recently played in the Super Bowl. I think without gospel being presented, it is irresponsible, though not willfully, if you choose to believe their website. Well, Casey, yes, there, there has been in some areas of social media and such, some measure of controversy uh, over the uh, campaign. I, I believe that he gets it campaign is aligned with the Southern Baptist Convention. I, I could be incorrect, uh, incorrect about that, but it's an advertising campaign that hopes to speak an evangelistic message to the culture. And so most recently, the commercials that they ran during the uh, American Football Championship that is often called the Super Bowl, uh, that's what it is called. It's not often called that. That's what's called the American Football Championship. Uh, it's a time that is very coveted for advertisers. And they pay a lot of money to advertise during what's called the Super Bowl. So uh, I think there were two ads run by He Gets Us, one or two. And basically the theme of it was that God, uh, that it, it was showing how people were washing the feet of those who are held by some in our society to be 
marginalized or outcast or, you know, disprivileged. All right. Um, you know, there's a lot to say about that. And a lot of it has to do with the basic perspective that a person has. What I mean is that. I think it's a very valid, I mean, it, it speaks something for American culture right now. That you can have two sides of a cultural debate. And each side of the cultural debate genuinely believes that they are the marginalized. They are the ones out of power. They are the ones, and they believe the other side has the power and has the, the strength. So, um, in that he gets it commercial, Christians were shown washing the feet of homosexuals, of people seeking an abortion, of uh, people who are per perhaps immigrants to, to the U.S., uh, people uh, from different ethnicities or races. And, and that comes from a very sort of liberal leftist perspective that says, these are the people being attacked or marginalized. Um, wh whereas there are people on the more conservative side, no, 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 we're the ones who are being marginalized. We're the ones who are being oppressed. And again, it's a very uh, interesting time in America. It's, I don't know how unique it is, but it's a very interesting time where you have these two vociferous sides that are absolutely convinced that they are the ones who are victims. So a lot of a person's perspective on the he gets it campaign, if you look at that and say, yes, the people represented as receiving the foot washings, they are all um, the ones who are the real victims in society today. Uh, those are the ones that God wants to show his love to. Okay, that. But I don't think that that's a universal given by any means. Casey, I think that it was a missed opportunity. Um, now, look, it, it's always difficult to criticize something for what it does not say, especially if you're talking about a very brief commercial spot. But it does seem like it was a missed opportunity to present something more clear, something more scriptural. I'm a firm believer in the power of the word of God. And it would have been great to see more of an emphasis on the word of God, to see what power that could have in speaking through some of the noise in the culture around us. Um, so uh, I, I think I would describe that he gets a campaign as one-sided looking at the culture and the problems in the culture from just one side and not seemingly even trying to look at it from two sides. And then the other thing as a missed opportunity to more clearly present. Uh, somebody put out on social media, I, I think the uh, gentleman is from Northern Ireland. I'm not sure about that. I can't even remember his name. And he put out an alternative commercial that could have been run. And basically, instead of he gets us, it was he saves us. And it was just the story of, uh, or, or just a very quick depiction of people whose lives have been radically changed by Jesus Christ. Honestly, I think that would have been a far more effective advertisement. So, the, Casey, those are some of my views. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not excited about the outrage machinery of our present moment. It seems that left and right, and I'm definitely a, a conservative person. So I would speak much more from a perspective, if you wanted to say left or right, I'd speak much more from a perspective on the right. But I, I'm wearied by how both left and right seem to have this outrage button that they pretty much seem to push about everything. And personally for me, I have a limit to the number of things that I can be genuinely outraged about. And if people kind of expect me to walk around in a state of perpetual outrage, uh, it, it's difficult because I, I can't be outraged about something new every day. It's just, it's just not working for me. So I want to keep my eyes on the things that are most important and look to make long-term impact in those things. All right, next question comes from Ben. 
Brian, who asks a question. John, the brother of Jesus, the John who wrote the Gospel of John, the John who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the John who wrote the book of Revelation, are they all the same? Uh, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, uh, Ben, there was no John, the brother of Jesus. There was a James, the half-brother of Jesus. Because you understand that when we say brother, we mean half-brother. So there was a John who was the half-brother of Jesus. Excuse me. There was a James who was the half-brother of Jesus. To my uh, thinking, I, I don't remember uh, one of the brothers of Jesus, half-brothers of Jesus, by name being named John. So if you're talking about our John who wrote the Gospel of John, the John who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and John who wrote the Book of Revelation, are they all the same? Yes, they are. At least that's my perspective. There are some people who've tried to make cases against that, but I think that that's the majority evangelical position, has been the majority uh, position throughout church history, that uh, the Johannian literature in the New Testament, Gospel of John, the Epistles of John, and the book of Revelation all come from the pen of the same person. Even though there are definitely some differences in style between them, uh, those differences of style reflect differences of purpose. And so, uh, no, those are the same. Th there was no John, to my knowledge, maybe one of our uh, viewers can correct me on that, but there was no John, to my knowledge, who was a uh, one of the half-brothers of Jesus. Okay, uh, next question comes from Arinze, who asks, Is praying in tongues and praying in the Holy Ghost the same? All right, uh, Arinze, not necessarily. I believe that if a person is genuinely praying using the gift of tongues, that they are praying in the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Spirit. But I don't think that's the only way to pray in the Holy Spirit. Not at all. I think it's possible for a person to pray in the Holy Spirit simply by being guided by the Spirit, influenced by the Spirit, in step with the Spirit. So to pray with the gift of tongues is a way to pray in the Holy Spirit, to pray in the Holy Ghost, but not the only way. If a person's prayer is guided, shaped, and moved by the influence of the Holy Spirit, then we could say that that's genuinely praying in the Spirit, praying in the Holy Spirit. So I hope that's helpful for you there, Arinza. Next question comes from Gary. Does the Bible tell us to always pray to Heavenly Father? Can we pray or talk to Jesus directly? Gary, yes. Now, I think the Bible gives a sort of a main mode or conception of prayer. The main mode or conception of prayer is praying to God the Father through and in the name of uh, Jesus Christ, God the Son, influenced and guided by the work of the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit. So to God the Father, through the name and the work of God the Son, guided by and influenced by the work of God, the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a general pattern for prayer. But we find in the Gospels people asking Jesus directly. We find people worshiping Jesus directly. We find people communicating with the Holy Spirit and, and this. And, and so I think that there's, there's a general pattern of prayer, but it's not meant to be absolutely restrictive. It's not wrong to worship Jesus. It's not wrong to pray addressing God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. So I think we can keep both in mind. We can keep the general or the main way that prayer is used and addressed, and then we can think about the um, uh, ways that aren't necessarily within that but aren't wrong in and of themselves either. Okay, uh, looks like we have come now to our lightning round. Let me take a drink. God bless the fellows and the good men and women who do the job at Blue Letter Bible. Appreciate your work. By the way, before I get to the lightning round, let me say something quickly. I want you to know that at Enduring Word, we don't have merchandise. We have books that we sell, but 
everything in our books is available for free online. It's just out there. The commentary, it's just out there. We don't have t-shirts. We don't sell coffee mugs. We don't sell hats. We don't sell pen and pencil sets. We don't um, have Patreons. We don't have VIP zones. I, I, I don't hang up the phone, uh, end this program here, and then meet with the people who contribute. Look, if other ministries want to do that, that's fine. That's between them and the Lord. But I just want you to know, that's not how we roll here at Enduring Word. Um, we just present everything we have freely. We've received freely. We give and uh, the folks who can receive it and help us out on the donation page. Praise the Lord for that. But if not, don't feel bad about it at all. We're happy to just to give as God gives us the ability to. All right. Uh, lightning round. Here we go. Jason asks, did Christ die for all the world or only die for Christians? Well, Jason, it depends on what you mean for. Jesus Christ died as a demonstration of love for all the world. Jesus Christ died to do that. So th there's certainly a sense in which Jesus died for all the world. Now, the death of Jesus Christ does not save everybody in the world. It saves only those who believe. It saves only those who are God's elect. By the way, those are the same group there. Those who believe and those who are God's elect are the same group. So you could use those terms interchangeably in as much as I'm speaking of right here. So the death of Jesus demonstrates the love, the heart, the desire of God for the whole world, but it doesn't actually save the whole world. So that's how I would say it, Jason. Tara asks this question. If my friend says that he doesn't believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God, are his prayers heard? Uh, Tara, I, I would say probably. I mean, I would want to know what else your friend believes because uh, somebody who says the Bible isn't the inerrant word of God, maybe they have a lot of other weird, strange beliefs. So, but um, God hears the prayers of a lot of people who are mistaken about things. And um, I think your friend is mistaken, very much so. I think that's wrong. Uh, the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Um, I, I, I sometimes scratch my head if people really want to argue otherwise. P people just want to say, oh no, no, it's loaded with mistakes. It's loaded with errors. And uh, you can't really tell what's true and what's not true. Uh, but no, it's still a pretty good book. I, I kind of don't get that. I, anyway, um, whenever somebody who believes that the Bible is filled with mistakes quotes a Bible passage, I, I always say to myself, how do you know that's not one of the parts that's a mistake? I, again, I, I think there's only one way to believe the Bible, that this is a book that's trustworthy and true. And uh, anyway. So, but even given that, Tara, and I'll say this to all of our viewers, and I know there's people out there who disagree with me, but I, I have a pretty big area that people can be wrong about certain things and, and God will still deal with them. I, I think it goes, now it's not a forever circle for sure. Uh, but I think a person can be wrong about inerrancy and still be definitely a believer and still be somebody that uh, that God would hear their prayers. I just think they should get that area of theology right. Uh, Laura asks this question, why is the Catholic Church stains your forehead with a black cross? Is this mentioned in the scriptures and what's the meaning of doing this? Okay, Laura, what you're talking about is the putting of ashes on the forehead in the shape of a cross on Ash Wednesday, which was just yesterday. And it marks in the Roman Catholic Church the beginning of Lent. Uh, not just the Roman Catholic Church. There's more and more Protestant groups that are doing this. Listen, let me tell you something. Dear brother or sister in Jesus Christ, are you sitting down for this? You are under no obligation to keep Lent. Let me say it again. You are under no obligation to keep Lent. If you want to do it, if you choose to do it, if you feel led by either your own conscience or God's Spirit to do it, Praise the Lord. But your righteousness before Jesus Christ is not based on your keeping of Lent. It's based on who Jesus is and what he's done for you. You are under no obligation to keep Lent. If you want to do it, praise the Lord. And so, Laura, uh, Ash Wednesday is just the marking of ashes to uh, commemorate the beginning of the season of Lent, where people uh, 
are supposed to fast or give up something over 40 days before Easter. That's really what it's about. And uh, I think Lent, 40 days before, it's getting a little bit faddish among some Protestants today, maybe among some Roman Catholics as well. Hey, whatever, fads come and go. Just as long as people understand that they should keep Lent if they want to, if they feel uh, convinced that it's right for them, and they should not think of themselves as superior to other brothers or sisters who don't keep Lent. All right. I've had my little say on that. You can tell Laura touched a little nerve with me. Not that her question was bad, but anyway. Okay, next question comes from Tuno Banan Shugotre. Hello from Sweden. Hey, son. Um, uh, Sodom of the 21st century. Well, uh, perhaps in some cases, yes. Uh, will Christians who sin during the rapture, right before in the middle of a sin, be raptured? Tunnel uh, Benan Shugothre, I would say yes in large measure. I don't believe in what's called the conditional rapture, where the idea is if, if a believer is just happens to be committing a sin right when the rapture is going to take place, uh, or you know within 12 hours, I don't know, whatever. You can get kind of crazy with the calculations of this. But if they happen to be committing a sin or something like that, uh, then they won't be taken. I think that that argues away from the idea that our salvation is in Jesus Christ. I go to the side of believing, though I understand some of the arguments and at least the parable of the ready and prepared and unprepared virgins waiting for the bridegroom. That gives me a little bit of pause. But even considering that, in the main part, I would say that I believe it's simply if you are born again by God's spirit, if you are a believer even if you are in a temporary occasion of sin, you're still going to go in the rapture. That's that's That would be my best understanding of it. I, I think that that idea has less problems associated with it than what's called the conditional or the partial rapture idea. Mojo 77 says, question, I listened to one of your sermons that stated one reason Job suffered was to teach the angels. Why do the angels need to be taught? Mojo 77, I, I don't know exactly what to tell you on this other than say that God wants to teach the angels. W why do we need to be taught? Why does anybody need to be taught in the universe? God wants to glorify himself by teaching the angels things about his nature, his character, and his works. And part of the way that God teaches angelic beings is through his work with the church. So really, Mojo 77, you could just back off and ask that question about why does God want to teach anybody anything? Uh, it's because ultimately it's to his glory and for their good. When God teaches us, it's for his glory and it's for our good. Maybe that's the best answer to your question. It's for God's glory and for the good of the angels. A daughter of the king asks, uh, if a Jehovah's Witness strongly believes in Jesus, will they go to heaven? Daughter of the king, here's the thing. What Jesus do they believe in? The Jesus that is presented by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is not the Jesus of the Bible. It's a Jesus of their imagination. It's an Aryan Jesus. It's a Jesus who's not God. So it's not a matter of how much. If somebody believes really strongly in a Jesus that doesn't exist, a wrong Jesus, then that helps them nothing. It avails them nothing. So really, a, a small faith in the right Jesus is much better than a big faith in the wrong Jesus. And when I say right and wrong Jesus, I mean the Jesus that is actually uh, presented to us in and through God's infallible word. Uh, Lupe asks, uh, I've heard pastors say that there's no spirit of this or that, but what about Exodus 28.3 and 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7? Uh, Lupe, yeah, um, look, I there are spirits, demonic spirits, who have certain strategies or emphasis. And you could call it a spirit of this or a spirit of that. I think that the objection really raises when people exaggerate this idea. When they think that smoking is caused by a nicotine spirit, as if there's some spirit out there and that's the only thing he does. It's the only thing on his business card. He's a nicotine spirit. You know, I'd love to tempt you with lust, but I don't have anything to do. I'm a nicotine spirit. I can't do anything about lust. I, I think it's that kind of over-identification. But certainly, there are demonic spirits that have strategies against believers. And if people want to identify a spirit 
somewhat according to that strategy, then there's something there. There's something to that. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Grandma asks, uh, do you have a favorite book of the Bible? Okay, Grandma, let me tell you. My favorite book of the Bible is whatever I'm teaching on right now. Right now, I've been spending a lot of time in the book of Joshua. And so this Sunday, I'm going to be speaking at Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson. Pastor Scott Richards is the pastor there, and they've asked me to come out and teach. And I'm going to be teaching on the Gibeonites in the book of Joshua. I think it's a fascinating story that has a lot to teach and a lot of very practical application for us. So what's my favorite book of the Bible? Whatever I'm teaching on right now, whatever I'm studying. So right now, I'm pretty high on the book of Joshua. And then uh, one more question comes from Ken, who asks, is this wrong? If somebody asks, how do I get saved? And the response is, turn from sin and believe, because it sounds like stop sinning and believe, which is impossible even after you get saved. Is it more accurate to say, as Acts 16, 30, 31 says, uh, what must I do to be saved? And they say, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Okay, Ken, it's not wrong to give a call to repentance. If you look at the preaching ministry of John the Baptist, you look at the preaching ministry of Jesus, you look at the preaching ministry of the apostles, you look at the preaching ministry of Paul, you look at the preaching ministry of the early church, you could say that in each one of those cases, the first word of the gospel is repent. That's what they said. When Jesus started preaching Galilee, he said, repent. When John the Baptist started, his message was repent. Repentance is not a wrong message to bring. Now, you bring up a very valid point about the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. Paul did not tell the Philippian jailer to repent. Why? Well, I think I can construct this. Paul and Silas stopped the jailer from killing himself. That jailer needed no help in turning his eyes off of himself and putting his eyes on Jesus. He had already come to a complete end of himself. He understood that there was no salvation in him or in the way that he had been living. I would say that the Philippian jailer was in a condition of repentance right there. What he needed and what he did not have was the message of hope in Jesus Christ. Therefore, the message was skipping right over the message of repentance, which was already evident in that man. And they went right to the message of freedom and uh, salvation in Jesus Christ. Listen, Ken, the way I like to explain it is like this, is that I'm looking for a coin here. Uh... Never mind. We'll skip over that. The, the, the message I like to present is like this, is that repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. You can't truly put your faith in Jesus until you, until you take your faith out of sin and self. Taking faith out of sin and self is what we call repentance. Putting faith in Jesus is what we call faith. They're two sides of the same coin. They're not two different things. They're two related things, like two sides of the same coin or two sides of the same shield. I hope that's helpful for you there, Ken. I don't make a radical distinction between them. I think that repentance and faith are vitally connected. That's how I would put it. All right, everybody, that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us today. So pleased that you could come. Uh, please remember, next week it's going to be a fantastic live broadcast with my friend, uh, Pastor Lance Ralston. And uh, I can't imagine that anybody listening here might be at the NRB Convention National next week. But if you are, uh, look for me. Say hello to myself and to my producer. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, may the Lord be with you. Thank you.